Welcome back to another watercolor bird tutorial. Today we're painting a red-breasted robin. I actually grew up in Wisconsin and this is the state bird of Wisconsin, so this bird holds a special place in my heart. If you guys have been following along with this series of bird tutorials, this is the fifth one. We're going to be placing our robin right here in the bottom left corner. This is a slight deviation from my earlier design where I had the robin up here, but I decided I liked the tail direction pointing towards the corner, so that's why I switched the hummingbird and the robin. Of course, you can certainly do this tutorial as a standalone bird painting. You don't have to do the whole collage of birds. Colors you'll need for this project include a gray. You could either use Payne's gray or I like to use Daniel Smith indigo and mix it with either transparent brown oxide or burnt sienna or you can mix burnt sienna and ultramarine. That makes a gorgeous gray as well. So there's lots of options when it comes to mixing grays. For the orange belly of the robin I'm going to be using my transparent orange and burnt sienna. The orange by itself will end up looking like my Baltimore Oriole just a little bit too bright. So I'm going to tone it down with the burnt sienna and that may end up being mostly what I use. For the yellow beak I'll be using Gamboge Nova and for the spatter which is the fun whimsical effect at the very end I'm going to stick with my transparent orange which is what I've used for all of my other birds. Make sure you have some water jars, paper towel for blotting, a pencil, and a watercolor brush. I'll be using my silver black velvet size 4 round brush. My paper is my Sennelier block. It's a 12 by 12 inch block of cold pressed watercolor paper, 100% cotton. It's amazing quality. It's a pricey block, so if you're worried about the sketch and you think you might smudge too much on the paper, definitely go ahead and do your drawing on a sheet of printer paper or something cheaper first, and then you can use transfer paper to trace it directly to your watercolor paper. I wanted to show you guys every step of this process, including drawing, so we're just going to begin there. All right, to help protect the rest of my paper, I'm just gonna put some paper towel right here set aside my paints for now and then I'm going to take my sketch again that I did earlier and I'm going to refer to it for size not necessarily placement because I decided on a different spot for it but I want to use that as a guide for how big I'm making the robin and I can also look at the other birds and try to make it something comparable to that. I have to keep in mind the two birds that are going to go here and here. I don't want to encroach upon that or make it too small. So those are all things to consider when you're doing a collage like this. If you're doing a standalone painting, obviously you don't need to worry about all of those other factors. So I've got my reference photo pulled up on a screen in front of me. I'm looking at the tail pointing down towards the corner of my paper, and then I want to mark the top of the head. So you can make a little mark for the head and for the tip of the tail, and that will show you the dimensions of your bird. Now from the tip of the tail to the base of the belly is about the same length as from the belly to the head. So you have a even subdivision halfway here to here to help you measure where the belly goes and where the tail goes. From there you can draw the slanting back feathers and then where the gray separates from the red breast it's about the same width from here to here. Now I want to make his, his body a little bigger than what I just sketched out. So what that means is that I may end up shortening his tail feathers than what is actually in the photo. And that's okay. You can always modify and adjust. It doesn't have to be exactly like your picture. So I'm making a few little changes that way. I'm making his body slightly longer than the tail and then where it meets the top of the head. His proud little head tipping upward. I love that tilt of the head. It's so cute. So try to get the expression, the angles, the tilts. That's what's going to give it the attitude that you're looking for. Erase any extra markings. You can always do that at the end too. If there are some pencil markings that bother you, you can erase them at the very end. Now I'm realizing that his head is a little too close to my hummingbird, so I think I want to lower him on the page slightly. To do that, just make every mark a little lower than you had it. This can be frustrating when you have to relocate the placement of your composition, but trust me, it will pay off. You want to make your mistakes now when you're working with an erasable pencil versus later when you're working with paint, which is more permanent. And with watercolor, it's a lot harder to fix your mistakes than other media where you can just paint right over the top. It's not quite that simple with watercolor. So make your drawing as accurate as possible to prevent regret later. <laughs> All right, so once again, we'll try this and get that tilt of the head right here. And I do like this placement better. 
I want to make sure he's not too large compared to my other birds. But I'm really looking at this belly versus this belly, and I think those are pretty equal. And that'll be a good balanced composition between the two birds. Once you have a rough sketch, which is definitely what this is at this point, you can start to go in and refine and modify your drawing to a more final stage where it's ready for paint. And that's what we're doing now. So I'm going in, really tightening up my edges. I'm going to erase that beak and just start over. I want it to be really concise. Since it's going to be bright yellow, it's going to show up quite a bit on the page here. It needs to be the right shape, doesn't it? And you see the feathers turning under. And then for the markings of the eyes, these are interesting. You can start by outlining the whole white shape first, which is quite wide. And then carving out the actual shape of the pupil from there. And then there's going to be a little highlight inside of that to avoid with the paint. This is delicate work, but these birds are almost life size. All right, so for the feathers, we're just going to draw the underside of the wing, which is going to be a dark color anyway because it's casting a shadow. So don't be afraid to sketch fairly dark there if you're sure of the placement. And then I'm going to erase my lines for the belly and try to do it all at once. Right here in the front, I'm going to leave a lost edge, so I'm not going to completely draw that shape. And on the underside, I'm going to leave a lost edge. But here in the center of the belly, we'll draw a little darker. Then we have this area where the orange feathers meet the white feathers underneath that back wing. And then we have the legs coming down. Bird legs can be just little straight line, little gestures. You don't have to render them out completely in all of their detail. Again, we're just trying to capture the general pose. I'm lightening up my pencil mark there because the yellow paint will easily get swallowed up by that graphite if I'm not careful. Okay, and then the last thing is to really mark out these tail feathers. Erase any extra marks that you don't like, but there we go. So I like that the tip of the tail is about as close as the tip of the tail with this bird. So I think that's balancing itself out nicely. With that, let's just add a couple more wing details before we start to paint. You don't need to draw all the feathers. Just a couple of straight lines is all you need to suggest those feathers. You don't have to draw them all. Yeah, I think that's all we need. All right, let's start painting. So now I'm gonna take my paper towel and officially cover everything to protect it. And I'm gonna move my palette closer on top of that for easy access. Let's grab one more paper towel and cover up the hummingbird. We just wanna make sure we don't accidentally splash over the top of it. The sketching is pretty much the hard part, isn't it? Now comes the fun part where we get to just lay down paint. Let's start with wet and wet with light gray. We're gonna take clean water Cover it over the top of the bird where the feathers are gray. So these back feathers and over the top of the head, just avoid the eyes for now, or the one eye that we can see, and spread around that water so that there are no puddles. You can take it down to the tail feathers or you can wait on those for now. Let's just focus on the bird's head and back wing. And here I'm gonna take a little of my indigo, swirl it around on the palette to test it out first and then mix in a tiny hint of brown and then I'm gonna go in and paint the lightest value on these gray feathers. Because we pre-wet the paper, the paint will spread out and soften really easily. And here where the feathers are a little lighter, you can remove some paint on your paper towel and then just spread out whatever paint is still there on the surface. We're just coloring it in right now with light gray. If you're not sure about your values, test it out on your paper towel or on a scrap piece of paper first before going in. Now here in the tail, we left this dry, right? So we can paint a little more distinctly with wet paint on dry paper and it'll stay put. It's not gonna soften out like the wet and wet did. So with my dark gray, you can see it ends up looking darker because it's not being spread out by the wet paper. 
And this is a really good thing when you're painting areas that are detailed like this. I'm going to dip in the water and remove a little bit. I'm going to color in this area between these two dark shapes so that it looks like a shadow gray, but still white feathers. I'm going to have to erase this pencil mark that's kind of unnecessary right there. I'm going to mix up some more dark gray with transparent brown oxide and indigo and just color in this tail feather really dark. It doesn't have to be overly detailed. Just try to paint it with a nice straight line. And as this begins to dry, you can start adding more layers over the top. Let's come back to the top of the head. The bird's head is black. It's the darkest part of his body. So we can paint that in with our dark combination working slower and more carefully around the eyes so that we don't accidentally cover up those little white markings. Before we get to that, try to resolve any edges that might form hard edges and not look like soft feathers. We want to make sure that everything looks soft and connected. This is why it's important to use a small brush for all these details. Now I'm going to rinse that out, remove some of it, and swipe along this edge, letting my brush scrape along the surface of the paper so that we have this textured look. You can do that again with an even lighter value. And let's go over the back one more time to kind of darken those feathers. You can resolve this edge if it's looking a little bit bumpy or rough. And if you have any excess water, be sure to pull it out in a way so that it doesn't pool and push back into the area you just painted. I'm seeing that happening a little here. It's forming this pool with the dark paint. I'm going to take even more indigo without any extra water in my brush and just really boost the black in the top of the head. If you're using Payne's Gray or Daniel Smith Indigo, which is more gray than blue, it looks black at its darkest value. And now I'm going to add a few little strips of brush strokes suggesting feathers crumpling and twisting and turning as the head is turning. And now I'll paint the eye. So here I really want to go slow. Take my time, and to make sure my paint flows, I just gently dip the tip in the water without removing any. This helps it flow easier on this bumpy cold press surface. Painting around that tiny little highlight. Constantly looking at my reference photo for guidance on all of these little details. The head is the most important part, right? It, carries the character and the lifelike look of the animal. Okay, so with that done, we can come back to the feathers, taking more of my gray mixture. And now I'm gonna paint some mid-tones within the feathers. If it's still wet, it'll soften out, so it'll look really, really diffused, which is nice. Where it's dry, the paint will stay put. Mixing up some more black using transparent brown oxide and indigo. And this portion of the feathers is pretty much dry, so I can add those dark separations in the feathers, these lines that we already drew with our pencil. Try to rest your hand on something to keep it steady. And as I said before, you only need a couple little marks to hint at those feathers. You don't have to explicitly draw on each one. Try to move your brush in the direction that the feathers are going. And that's pretty much all that needs. You know, it doesn't need a ton more detail. All right, we can darken the underside of the tail feather one more time too while we're at it before moving on to something else. Okay, so now I'm gonna take clean water and wet the underside of the belly. Now it's time to do that beautiful orange belly. So we're gonna use wet and wet again. If your water is not completely clean, grab a second jar of pure clean water and use that. That's why it's helpful to have two. 
and we're coloring it in with water. All right, so now let's take our burnt sienna. And you can see it's not quite orangey enough on its own, so I'm mixing in some transparent orange. This combination of burnt sienna and transparent orange isn't quite as orange as my Baltimore Oriole, but I don't want it to look brown either. So let's start at the top, just gingerly adding some paint at first to see how it reacts to the wet paper. Painting almost up to the pencil edge, right where I want that lost edge. And then I'm going to use the belly of the brush and just swirl it into the paint, pulling it downward. Beautiful broad down strokes of the brush. Rinsing that out. Then I'm going to help kind of soften and guide the edge here a little better. Helping this transition look a little more natural with a little bit of gentle scrubbing. And then I'm going to take some of my indigo and mix that in with that orange so I have a rich brown. And with that I'll begin to darken on the underside of the belly using almost this curved motion to suggest the scale-like look of these feathers. Turning on the belly. If for some reason your paint seeps out and forms an ugly edge like that, you can always lift it back out. A flat brush like this one will work well for that. So take it, rinse it with clean water, remove any excess water in your paper towel, and then gently scrub along that edge, removing the paint that you're lifting onto the paper towel. So in this way, you're not only making that edge look a little bit better, but you're also sort of softening it out so that it looks downy soft like the feathers of a bird. There we go. All right, let's paint the beak next. As I said before, I'm going to use a bright warm yellow. This is Gamboge Nova. You can pretty much paint it straight out of the palette and onto the beak. So pretty, beautiful yellow. And then I'm just going to drop a little hint of that into the belly as well, here and there. Then the last thing before we add a few final details will be the legs. For these I'm just going to use indigo, water down a little bit, and quick suggestive little brush strokes painting in those legs a nice light gray. Doesn't have to be anything too fancy or detailed. We're just hinting at those legs. If you want to add more of a shadow, you can go darker with your indigo and just suggest add a little shadow right there, maybe across the top and just under the belly where the body appears heavier. And then you can add any final details. If you want to make the wings just a little more detailed, feel free to add a few more little specific brush strokes with your indigo, creating separated feathers. But as I said, don't go overboard with this. You don't want it to appear overworked or like one area is overly detailed versus another. And then I think I'm going to take a wash and just darken this gray one more time, leading up to the wings. And let my brush scrape across the surface so that it's a textured edge where it meets the lighter gray. And with the belly dry enough, we can go back in and add another boost of color, if you wish, with your Burnt Sienna Transparent Orange Combo. I just want it to look a little bit more like there's a shadow in the belly while adding a little bit of texture. And once again, if the paper is dry, use that cold pressed paper to your advantage. Scrape your brush along the surface to produce that dry brush texture. Yes, brilliant orange. Okay, so then the final thing will be to pull this aside so we can see our whole composition, see how it's balanced out. Yes, and I think that looks lovely with this orange belly balanced by the other in the corner. Now we just need to add a little bit of spatter and a surface for our bird to be sitting on. So I'm going to take a little bit of gray from my palette right here and just suggest a stump, just like we see in the photo, 
little shadow shape there, letting the brush scrape along the surface of the paper, catching on the texture. That's all it needs. And then let's take some pure transparent orange with lots of water in the brush and do a little bit of spatter. I think I want it to be even more watered down. And don't go overboard with this effect. Add a couple more manual droplets if you wish. This is for balance in the composition and also to give it a beautiful whimsical effect. They don't have to be perfect circles. <laughs> There we go. I hope you had fun painting the Wisconsin State Bird. I sure did. Be sure to join me for the next watercolor bird tutorial coming next week, and I'll see you then.